Hi everyone, Sylvia here once again, and today we're going to be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians, and we'll start in chapter 4 and we'll finish in chapter 7. I love the Word of God, but I love it not just because the Word causes me to feel good about myself, but I love the Word of God because it provokes me and causes me to allow the Holy Spirit asking Him to show me me to allow me to see how do I line up with the word of God, my ways, my thoughts, my actions. The word of God is very provoking. And in our reading, you're going to see that Paul gave and made some provoking statements. And I pray that you won't let them just go over you, but you'll take time out and with the Holy Spirit leading you, because he's our teacher every step of the way, showing you and taking you deeper. The Bible says deep calls unto deep. And what he's talking and getting us, or hopefully that we understand is the deep things, the deep things within us, the spirit man, the inner man. How does he, and when I use the word he, that's both male and female, because that's what the Bible does. How does he, my spirit man, line up with Jesus? My Lord and Savior, the one that I follow, the one that I am to become more like every day, to be an example, same way with you, of him on the earth. Do my ways, my actions, my thoughts, my deeds line up with the very word of God. Now, that's what I want you to begin to ponder within you, the deep searching and rejoice in that. Because I believe, at least I know for myself, I want God to examine me and to determine those things that are in me now before I stand before him. It helps me to understand why David said the things that he did. Search me. See if there's any wicked ways in me. Create in me a clean heart and give me a steadfast spirit. Wash me with hyssop and I shall be clean. See, you and I should be crying out for the continual washing of the blood of Jesus Christ. But that begins with us understanding truly where do I stand? Not according to me, not according to others, but according to God. I want, and I'm going to read this because it's too good. And I want you to meditate on what Paul is saying. Chapter four, you know, I was planning on sharing a little in four, five, six, and seven, but I'm probably not going to get there. Why? Because this one is the one that provoked me and the Holy Spirit is leading me, leading me. I love it when he shows me me, gives me an opportunity to repent or give me an opportunity to really be able to see myself through God's eyes. I cannot tell you how important it is that we see ourselves through God's eyes and not through our own we live in some wicked times and wicked times because we may not be doing A, B, C, D might convince us that we're good to go. But what about your inner thoughts? What about that inner man? What about your spirit man? What condition is he in? And again, that's male or female because this is for all. In chapter four, we, before I go there, understand that in chapter three, there was some things that was going on. There was some disputes. They were trying to figure out who was the apostle of all apostles, comparing one to the other and all of this. And Paul simply was telling them in three, that this is foolishness. You're still on milk. You should be in the meat. Because if you really understand, whoever we are, whatever gift we have, it's not ours. It came from God. So why boast? That's what he says in four, chapter four. Why boast? Why try to esteem yourself higher than anyone else? Because you received the free gift. And that's what we must understand. The free gift that we receive from Christ Jesus. Whatever your anointing is. It's not because you earned it or you even deserved it, but it is simply because of the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why God did it. The only way to the Father is to the Son, and the only way to receive the Holy Spirit is from the Son himself. So whatever we operate in, we operate in it unto God. We don't have any super Christians or superheroes. 
Unfortunately, we live in a day and time where we see too much of that. But Paul brings it back to the essence. He says, so Apollo and I should be looked upon as Christ's servants who distribute God's blessings by explaining God's secrets. What he's simply saying is we are simply servants. And that's the same way it is today. Amen. And we have a responsibility to distribute God's blessings by explaining the secrets of God. Amen. In other words, we have been called to be stewards over the word of God. And that stewardship requires that we do it truthfully. Speak the truth in love. Desire the truth. Share the word. Word in its t in entirety, the way it is, not just the stuff that causes people to tickle their flesh, their ears, but to know the word of God. So that again, that word can cause us to reflect, meditate on it, and then cry out to God, show me me, show me me, help me to get my mind, my heart in alignment with you. He goes on to say, now, the most important thing about a servant is that he does just what his master tells him to do. In other words, Paul is saying that the servant, whether you're an apostle or just a lay person, we're all servants unto God. And what's the most important thing we can do? It's exactly what he tells us to do. In other words, obedience. We must obey the word of God. And in obedience, then he can use us so that as we receive the free gift of being free from the bondage of sin, we can help others. And the free gift of God assess me, look at me, see, and help me to see myself through your own eyes. Amen. He says, so again, faithfulness, faithfulness, not faithful to the world, not faithful to ourselves, not faithful to others, but faithful to God in the midst of the world, in the midst of others, and in the midst of all things. Amen. Glory be unto God. He says, what about me? He says, I have been a, have I been a good servant? Well, this is Paul speaking. I don't worry about those things. He said, I don't worry about that. I don't even worry myself about what you think or what others may think about me. He said, I don't even trust my own judgment in this. Why? He said, even though my conscience is clear and, but I can't let that be my final proof. Paul is saying, my conscience is clear. I don't know of anything, I, but I can't let that be my final proof. Why? Because the judge, and that's who Jesus is. Yes, he is love. And the Bible tells us that. But it tells us over and over again, he's the judge and he's going to judge not the father, but the son. And the judge, the judge is coming to do what? What judges do. And that's to judge our attitude, our actions, and our things that we do on the earth. Amen. But here's the beauty. When we repent because we get right with God, we align ourselves, we receive the truth that's coming from God and not from others who might be puffing us up, flattering us. But what is God saying? And does God like this? Does God approve of this? And if it is no, he gives us an opportunity to cry out to him to repent and he will forgive us and wash us us all, all over again. Clean us of our iniquities, wash us of our sins, and then let us begin to walk in right alignment, right position with him again. He says this, he says, my conscience is clear, but even that isn't proof. It is the Lord himself who must examine me and decide. Oh, I'm in verse number four. I know we have different translations. This is the living Bible. But Paul is saying, again, even though his conscience is clear, he said, it is the Lord himself who must examine me and decide. See, I don't know about you, saints, but I want him to examine me while I'm alive. Every single day, I say, God, examine me. Examine my heart. Examine my thoughts. Examine my life. Examine my fruit. Why? Because while I'm still alive, he can correct me. He can reprove me. He can rebuke me. 
and I can change. But if I stand before him as much as he loves me and as much as he loves you on that day of judgment, saints, we have missed the mark and we'll stay in that missed the mark state. If I'm missing it now, I want him to tell me now so that he can bring correction and reproof. I want the discipline. Why? The Bible says that if he doesn't, then you're not a child. You're not a son. You're not a daughter. You don't belong to him. So I want to be disciplined. I want to be chastised by God now because that's how much he loves me. He doesn't want to lose me. He wants me not to perish, but to have everlasting life with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he goes on to say in verse five, so be careful not to jump to conclusions before the Lord returns as to whether someone is a good servant or not. When the Lord comes, he will turn on the light so that everyone can see exactly which e exactly what each of us is really like deep down in our hearts. Do you hear what he's saying? When he's coming, he's going to turn on the lights so that everyone can see exactly how we are deep down inside. Another version says he's going to come and uncover. He's going to come and reveal our motives, our intents from our hearts. Saints, we must get our hearts right with God now. Are we doing what we're doing because we love him and him alone? Or are we doing it because we want others to see us? We want others to notice. We want others to pop us up. We want to appear godly, but we are not. What about our thoughts? Oh, if God was to come and expose your thoughts, would you stand up and smile? Or would you be ashamed? See, this is where I am because I realize that I have some thoughts that are not of God. And I want God to expose them right now. I have some motives that I've done some things that were not motivated by my love of God or love of other people. And I want God to show them perhaps it was so that others could see. Maybe I was in a place of anger and I did it begrudgingly. And they may not have known, they may not have seen it, but God did. And he's going to come and he's going to expose the very motives of our heart. So my prayer and my cry is, God, may my heart become right with you now. Show me the errors of my way and show me the wickedness of our heart, of my heart. Because you said that our heart is despitefully wicked, even from our youth. So therefore, God said that God is the truth. He's the way and the life. And so I want him to speak the truth to me. And I challenge you, if you don't, want him to do the same thing for you. Saints, we have to get our hearts right with God. And he goes on to say, and he says, and everyone will know why we have been doing the Lord's work. At that time, God will give to each one whatever praise is coming to him in Closing, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that Jesus is going to come and he's going to expose the very motives of our heart. And all will see and know why we've been doing what we've been doing. Have we been doing it for God? Or do we have other ulterior motives that were not of God and definitely not pleasing for God? And, but here's the beauty for those who choose him now and choose to get our hearts right with him now. When he when we stand before him, he's going to give us praise. You know, he's going to praise over us. He's going to praise over us. We praise over him, but the time is coming when our works, when our attitude, our thoughts, and our heart line up with him. He's going to praise over us, and all will see, and all will know. My final comment and thought is, that is the one that we should be striving and obtaining to receive the praise from. Why receive a temporary praise or flattery from man, woman, boy, or girl now? They won't last because those works and those things are that, that hay, that wheat, that stubble that will be burned immediately. But when our heart is right, because our thoughts are right, that penetrate our heart, that cause will come out of our mouth, to come out of our mouth, 
in trueness, in honesty, in love, because we love God, then those are the things that he's going to praise us for. Desire the praise of God and not the praise of man. God bless you. I love you all. Have a great rest of your day. Amen.